If you struggle to understand the loving and providing nature of God, maybe it's because you just don't have a fatherly role model. Today we're talking about trusting God as Abba Father. Join us next on Significant Insights. Hello and welcome to the program. Good to have you with us. The great Protestant reformer Martin Luther had a harsh, severe father, and he transferred those traits to his ideas about God. In fact, at one point he said, love God, I hated him. Now that was until God revealed his love, grace, and mercy to Luther, and it changed his life. And a lot of us still define God in light of our earthly fathers. If they were present and were loving, we can receive that love from God, but if they were absent and didn't provide or protect us, then we have a harder time seeing God for who He really is. My guest, Pastor Matthew Stevenson III, ministers to a high percentage of millennial men at All Nations Worship Assembly in Chicago. TLN President Deborah Fraser talked to him about his book, Abba, written for those men and others to help people experience God as Father. How or where do we get our ideas about God? Um, well, it varies story to story, but um, generally speaking, people perceive and understand God through their life's experiences. So when they are invited to a relationship with Christ and they are subsequently introduced to a church, they try to process what the scriptures say or their teachers say about God with life pictures and life language. So um, when they start to hear things about God being a, a provider or uh, a healer or a helper, what helps them to conceptualize that are the people or the pictures and the moments um, that they receive that in their lives. The challenge with that is when they try to uh, conceptualize God's perfection and His inability to be flawed, it produces a lot of strain on the relationship between a person who has flawed helpers and life experiences to understand a perfect God. And so we have grace and mercy to reach in for fuller understanding of who He is and what He wants. But generally speaking, people speak the language of their lives. So when they feel that they are, um, can be you know, they're unflawed. Mm -hmm. Is that from experiences they may have as a child or with a father? Certainly, you know, we are learning from the time we come out of the womb. I always say that the household is the most important uh, classroom and it's the first classroom. You are learning uh, from the time you are in pre-infancy all the way to the time you are ready for uh, professional school or educational school, but the household trumps any lesson that mm -hmm. you learn throughout all of your adult life, all of your professional life. Um, none of those lessons that you learn for professional career or for your academic uh, tenure are going to be more su su significant or substantial than what you've learned in the house. And so processing God or trying to conceptualize God has to go through all of those life lessons, life experiences before we have even dare to see him as he is. And we see him, in your opinion, as he is, as Abba Father. Well, well that's the goal. Yes. That is the objective. Um, it is a very strong challenge. Jesus taught us to pray, our Father, and um, Jesus is perfect theology, so I believe he wanted us in the model prayer to understand that that is at, at the top of God's priority is to get the human race to see that the most important thing he likes to be not just referred to but interacted with is as a father. You know, I love the way you wrote this book, very direct, mm -hmm. very straightforward. Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve sinned yes. and that's why we're here yes. where we are today. Yes. But I also love this point here, talking about abandonment. Yeah. Feelings because many of us were abandoned sure. as children. So feelings of abandonment can also lead us to conclude that God is distant. 100%. We may experience abandonment when we see unanswered prayer and during times of hardship. Sometimes when we pray, when we call out to God or even when we read our Bibles, it can feel as if God is not there. Certainly. So that can stem from our childhood. 100%. It can stem from our childhood, I want to, but I want to go deeper than that. It can also stem from your own interactions with yourself. You know, childhood is the is the place where we not only learn how to interact with people, but it's also where we learn how to define and interact with ourselves. And there are many people 
uh, particularly in our culture, that live in so much self-rejection mm -hmm. um, that they, they end up spending a large part of their lives being committed to developing a version of themselves that people can understand or accept, whether it's the truth or not. And all of that are challenges because the way you see yourself will come across in what you communicate, what you expect, and prayer, interaction with God, worship, Bible study, all have that in common. They are forms and venues of communication. So if you are challenged in your communication because of an identity flaw or because of a break or the common issue is abandonment, it's going to affect what you believe is important enough for God to hear and what you have the faith to believe He will respond to. And as you say here, it leads us into hopelessness, saying things such as, why do I even try? Yes. I hear that a lot. Yeah. It's, it's a very easy thing to have your prayer life be become bankrupt uh, because God is, I often say, He is the most misunderstood person <laughs> in the universe. <laughs> and uh, He has been trying to get the human race to understand since the book of Numbers that I am not a man that I should lie. So it is the normal and the human thing to contrast God to the men in our lives, the authority figures in our lives. So should they have been uh, inconsistent or should they have been something they were not, or most importantly, should they have been not bound to their word? Mm -hmm. Then those are challenges when it comes to our relationship to God because understanding that he is a being that is extremely committed to his word, so much so that that's what he refers to Jesus as, is the word, he is integral. Perceiving that and comprehending God's integrity from a life that has taught you that people have a tendency to be inconsistent or not integral or some cases malicious or abusive allows us to be kind of cultivated in abandonment. Possibly even fear. 100%. Oh, absolutely. Abandonment produces fear and it, it produces uh, even probably more dangerous than fear is self-reliance. Uh, self-consciousness and even a degree of self-centeredness because when you live your life in fear you it's 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 one of the the byproducts of learning that you are the only thing you can trust so the in a life where a person trusts themselves more than anything else it's difficult for them to believe some of the vast things that God wants for a life and purpose because we've become our own rock our own uh, a hiding place and and that creates a major break in the way we communicate with the yeah, Lord what about um possibly fear from some actions God may take. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a harshness, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Sodom and Gomorrah. All, sure, sure. So what about that fear? Well, we again, we generally def interact with God based upon our ideas or some teachings of what He should be. In my book, one of the consistent things I repeat is that we need to interact with God based upon what he says about himself. Mm -hmm. He has a personality, he has priorities, he has things that he does, and they don't contradict. The challenge is we don't use what he said about himself to interact with him. We, we interact with him based upon what we believe a God should be, what he wants, and then uh, we, we almost overestimate our comprehension of him. So we forget that as a human being, our intellect caps off at the ability to fully explore who he is. No one person uh, uh, in a century could fully explore the vastness of the character and the nature of God. I mean, it took 66 books for, for him to present to us a man that lived 33 years and was still struggling to understand and comprehend Jesus. So I think that living a life of faith has to do with realizing at some point that I'm not going to always understand an action of God or a move of God, but I have to, if I interact with him as father, I do know he only does what's best for me, even if I don't agree or can't see it now. Give us an example. Oh, I'll give you a very common one. This is controversial, but our, our church is probably 70% full of millennials and they're money-making, <laughs> impactful millennials. Our most active, most consistent, most present people happen to be men, and the women like it that way. In my dealings with, with a lot of the men in our church, uh, millennial age uh, and older, um, is trying to uh, come to terms with their own relationship with their dad. And one of the things that I have found myself counseling people through to show how God will sometimes use a, a circumstance uh, that's painful to impose his care measures on a life. I found myself over, over, and, over and again helping men understand even had your natural father been what you wanted him to be, 
it could have adversely affected what God wanted in your life. Now, it is God's plan that fathers reflect and embrace, and I want to use the word embody him. But in, uh, in a life, in a father's life, who has decided not to be his best self, not to be committed to the purposes and the plans of God, not to be in agreement with the word of God, sometimes that distance, even from a natural father or what you may feel like is a lack of involvement, may be a very uncommon, a very harsh course correct to make sure that in your desperation for your father that you wouldn't have become a student of destructive behavior, inconsistent patterns. And it's a very complex thing to understand because everybody wants their father in their lives. But when it's, when it's, when it's, uh, when it's shown that a father has resolved in himself that he's going to be how he wants to be, sometime in God's mercy, he allows for that distance to bring about the best in us, and he supplies us with what we need from masculine roles elsewhere. It is possible to have an imperfect father and still get the victory in your life and in your purpose, but I often try to help people to resolve that your father's distance does not always have to be disastrous. Sometimes it is the protection of the Lord to make Make sure that you don't become catechized or discipled into a life that would take you away from the plan of God. More on God as Abba Father right after the break. Stay tuned. The most important things that I would say that people should know about knowing God as Father is it is impossible to know yourself apart from knowing Him. Welcome back. Today, Deborah Fraser is talking with Matthew Stevenson, senior pastor of All Nations Worship Assembly, about his book, Abba. One of his key messages is that regardless of what we have experienced with our earthly fathers, Abba Father is able to redeem the failure, hurt, and pain from the past. What does God the Father want from us? God the Father wants out of us sonship. His highest objective is not just to populate the world with Christians or to populate the world with a message or propaganda. His highest objective is to manifest His Son in the earth. That is God's highest goal, is to manifest Jesus in the earth. Ephesians 1 says that the Christ who is the head should fill all and all. And so I believe that holiness, which is Christ's likeness manifest, is the highest potential of every human heart. And that is His goal. He wants Christ manifested in all that He is and all that He wants and all that He does. And that's why it takes for a person to conceptualize God as Father to fully become Christ-like. What do you mean by orphan spirit? Oh my goodness, the orphan spirit. Let's talk about that. So we live in a orphaned culture. Um, where I'm from and where our church is, uh, it is almost uncommon. I always, I come from a military family and uh, I always tell people when talking about my journey in this that it was odd in elementary school for me to learn that a father was in the house. It, it was odd and almost funny. So when we found out that a person's father walked into school or was actually married to their mom, we were like, oh my God, it was bizarre because it was so unheard of. That fundament, that foundation sets not just my life but a lot of people's lives up to, to, to number one, expect two mandates from one person. So normally or statistically, the mom is both mom and dad, and she's not even physiologically or spiritually equipped uh, to handle the pressures of both of those, not just roles, but callings of God. And then you have to spend your life trying to figure out how to interact with authority. God set it up in the world that the way promotion works is, and, and, and all prosperity is by promotion. Pro, uh, progress is by promotion, but promotion flows from authority. You can't just promote yourself of your own accord. Like nobody walks outside and says, hey, today I'm a cop, everybody obey me. So promotion is an issue of authority, but where there is an orphan heart, there is a fear of authority, a suspicion of authority. There is a callousness toward it, and you almost customize it. Like in your heart, you start to tailor make 
what authority should be. And you see it everywhere in the church. You know, it, it amazes me, whether it be with politics or whether it be with spiritual leadership or even business leadership, it always amazes me how flagrant people can be with criticisms about seats that they are not, nowhere near competent enough to sit in. It's, it's, it's like being able to advise and assess and, and critique beyond your experience or educational expertise. The root of that, though, is fear and awkwardness with authority. And I really believe that that's something that grieves God because if people can't fully and safely and healthily process authority, it's difficult to be promoted. It's difficult to go through the processes uh, of life and, and maturation where God watches how you interact with a human authority to determine how you can handle the prosperity that he wants for your life. That is a major effect of the orphan spirit. And maybe abandonment? Yes. Yes. You know, when you are an orphan and you live your life uh, with an orphan heart, um, there are certain things that you do even habitually that you don't realize you do. One of them is it, I, there is no such thing as an orphan that has full faith in God because an orphan has to construct plan B's in case whatever God wants does not work out. When you are an orphan, your provision is your own responsibility, your future is your own. You live your life in defense of disappointment. So everybody is guilty until proven innocent. There is a suspicion towards people who are purely motivated towards you because an orphan heart cannot conceptualize why somebody would want to just freely, without any obligation, be a thing or provide a thing to a life with Without expectation of something in return. Did you experience that? Well, yeah, but mainly because I did not have the privilege of growing up in a church environment where there was a such thing as investment. It, the whole concept of investment was uh, foreign to me until I came into present truth. But in our church and in our church background, um, not as much in my household. They were very strong with education. But in the church background, when you are 13 and you say, hey, the call of God is on my life, they pretty much say, good luck, meet us when you're 18. You know, There is no investment. And when a life grows, without ever having felt being the target of somebody's investment, it teaches you to be there for yourself. The problem with that is that works up until you have to forgive, up until you have to have mercy, up until you have to release people from wrongdoings because Again, you live in suspicion of everybody but you. And you also tend to develop certain degrees of hip hypocrisy because you end up being really, really, really harsh on issues that are in people that you are more forgiving in in yourself because of that type of uh, mentality and outlook. In summary, what are the most important things you want people to know about Abba Father? The most important things that I would say that people should know about knowing God as Father is it is impossible to know yourself apart from knowing Him. Mm -hmm. And there are people who go into what I think is an endless, pointless journey where they meander to find themselves. And, and the challenge is it's like exploring a product and trying to get to understand the full potential of the product without ever having consulted the manufacturer. You cannot do it. The breakdown of the product, the making of the product, the purpose of the product, the time span of the product is all in the mind of the manufacturer. So the way you learn yourself and the way you find out the truth about yourself is not to go in yourself. It's to go and to find him. And the more you find him as he is, the more you understand, see, and trust what he wants out of you. We're almost out of time. I have to ask you, why, why did you write Abba? I wrote Abba because I became increasingly concerned with the fact that people are not really interacting with God as much as they are their ideas of him. So I had to write the book to let people know there are some things that God said about himself that provide for us a healthy template for our interaction with him. He is not uh, 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 what we've been through and he is not our ideas of him. Um, he is a father and it is not until we reach fully and press fully into that character statement of God that we can get everything out of him that he intended for our lives. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. You can get a copy of Abba online wherever books are sold and you can learn more about Pastor Stevenson's church at allnationswa.com. Final thoughts on being a gentle breeze right after the break. Jesus Christ is here to transform us, to mold us, 
to be like a gentle breeze. Even with people that don't believe what we believe, we should even be a gentle breeze in their lives. Pastor Matthew Stevenson is committed to help his congregation grow in the Lord and succeed in the world as well. As believers, when we're in the world, we're representatives of Christ. Dimas Salaverios, pastor of the Infinity Bible Church in the Bronx, shares how we can bring refreshment to those around us in today's final thoughts. Hello, and I just want to share a verse with you today that has meant so much to my life and I think it's a gift from God to the body of Christ. And it's in Matthew 5, 5, where it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, I just came back from a trip to Israel, and I was on the, the mount where Jesus spoke those words. And let me tell you what's so interesting about the word meekness. And I believe every Christian should have meekness as a part of, of their character. Now, the word meekness means in Greek, the working definition is to be like a gentle breeze. Can you imagine that? Now, I grew up in New York City where, I mean, the summers get hot. And I, when we didn't have an air conditioner in my home. I mean, my mother just had this fan. And she, my sisters, they had like a fan that blew to both of them. But for my brother and mother, she would put this fan just in this hallway, mainly blowing a little bit towards her room. And once in a while, a, a gust of wind would come into my brother's bedroom where we were on bunk beds. And I remember I would lay there and once in a while, this breeze would come. And I would say to my brother, oh my gosh, Chad, did you feel that? He would say, yes. I said, oh, that felt so good. Later on, I'm not going to lie to you, I was frustrated because I realized fans were only $10, and my mother had a lot of money. I don't know why she didn't get 10 fans, but that was the time in which we lived. But I never forgot the memory of feeling that gentle breeze. And I think as Christians, everywhere you go, in the workplace, in the marketplace, even dealing with your brothers and sisters in the Lord, remember that God says, not the assertive, not the forceful, but he says the meek, those who are like a gentle breeze will inherit the earth. So I want to encourage you in the supremacy of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is here to transform us, to mold us, to be like a gentle breeze. Even with people that don't believe what we believe, we should even be a gentle breeze in their lives. Because God has called us to do what? To be served? No. But he's called us to serve and like Christ, to give our lives for a ransom for many. So we're challenged, and I want to challenge you everywhere you go. Bring joy. Bring the love of Christ and be a gentle breeze. God bless. Keep looking up and keep Christ number one. I'd like to thank Pastor Sala Barrios for uh, the, uh, the word. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. You know, it's interesting how we equate God so often with what we understand naturally. Sometimes we have a difficulty dealing with the supernatural aspect of God because we're natural and it's hard for us to bridge that gap. And I think especially for those who are watching the program, who perhaps had a difficult childhood, maybe a father who, like Martin Luther, was Martin Luther's father was very severe and harsh, and, and so somehow you attribute those same qualities to God. I want you to know something. God is the perfect father, and he loves you, and he is concerned about every aspect of your life, and, that, and God wants the very best for you. And somehow, if we can put that in perspective, and understand that he loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live, to die, to be resurrected, so that his expression of love could bring salvation to us. And that's what he's done for you. So think in terms of God as beyond your earthly father. This is the God who has infinite love and concern for who you are and what your needs are. God bless. Mm -hmm.